Hello, my name's Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 111 on resilience. Now, this is the start of a new trilogy, the Resilience Trilogy, and I'll tell you how we got here. I've received more requests to do vlogs on resilience than any other topic. And I'm not quite sure what our wonderful students and our great colleagues around the world are asking for when they're saying we want something on resilience. I think it's a lot like time management, that when students use these phrases, resilience and time management, they're actually referring to something else. They're a proxy. And we've just got to try and work out what our students are meaning when they use these words and phrases. So if I can just get my time management right, then I can finish this PhD. If I can just be more resilient, then I can finish the PhD. But time management and resilience are rarely the cause, and yes, they're rarely the solution for what is going right or wrong in a PhD program. But your commitment to them tells me something. It suggests that something is just not quite right with your PhD program. And remember, this is not just a, a doctoral issue. Resilience as a concept exists sort of everywhere at the moment. It's deeply ambiguous, and I also think probably particularly troubling. And my wonderful PhD student, the wonderful Andrew Patterson, hi Andrew, has just submitted his PhD probing, exploring, and really critiquing the role of resilience in the South Australian police force, SAPOL, fascinating thesis. And he really takes on that commitment to resilience. Similarly we see this concept used a lot in first responder literature, particularly paramedicine as well. And the self-help movement, you know it's my favourite movement, so not, but the self-help movement is also deeply committed to this notion of resilience. So in this trilogy, in this first vlog in particular, I'm going to take on the term resilience and I'm going to look at the iterations and how it has been defined and which definitions and tropes are particularly useful for you. So what I'm going to do is provoke you a little bit today so that when you use the word resilience, so I need to be more resilient or resilience is important to me, what are you actually describing? What are you meaning by that word? And the next vlog after this one will be relatively challenging for me to, to deliver for obvious personal reasons, but it is going to be offering some concrete strategies, structures, systems and decisions for you to make in the good times so when trouble strikes you have a system and a protocol around you that will stop the buffeting, the personal, the professional, the emotional buffeting. And the final vlog in this trilogy comes from a brilliant request by Raj. Hi Raj, a wonderful student who has actually just about finished his PhD and he said to me a couple of weeks ago, how brilliant is this, look Tara I've been successful in my PhD, I've finished but I just didn't thrive in the program. How do you thrive in a PhD? Now, what a fascinating question that is. So Raj, I'm gonna finish off this trilogy if I can. There's some literature there, so I'm gonna shape that up for you to answer your question. So this trilogy is dedicated to some very, very special people at Flinders University. Ben, Nat, Sean, Oscar, and Alex. You're very precious to the Office of Graduate Research. You're very, very precious to me. And it's been one of the great privileges of my life as your Dean to accompany you on your doctoral journey. So all of you are nearly there now, but this vlog series and this vlog particularly today is for you. So resilience it is. Let's get into it from the beanbag. Let's do this. How beautiful is this winter sun, by the way, in Adelaide? I just feel like a little cat sort of sitting in front of a window, sort of basking, but it's lovely and you know, welcome to beautiful Adelaide and the beautiful sunlight. So let's do this. The reason why, and I've been working on resilience for you for the last year, and I've been very uncomfortable because the literature's been so poor and pathetic and a bit hippie for me, but I discovered a great scholar, David Chandler, and I've been following all of David Chandler's work in the last year or so in preparation for this vlog. This vlog was one of them where that's been sitting on the floor of my office for a year. That's how long I've been thinking through this topic and idea. 
And why Chandler's made a difference is he's shown that there are actually three iterations or three modes or models of resilience. The first framework is the most common and indeed the most commonsensical, that is the maintenance of status quo. So when we think of bouncing back, that's the resilience model. So it's the homeostatic approach. It's regulating equilibrium, if you will. So it's used quite frequently in vocabularies in both engineering and psychology. It's often about recovery after a trauma or a crisis. So if you think about the Christchurch earthquake, resilience was required in terms of the engineering protocol about how you create that bounce back ability in a city suffering a natural disaster. You'll find also in social work, a lot of the social work definitions and theories use this model of resilience. But there is another model, the autopoetic approach, that bouncing back is not the goal. I think this is really interesting. It's not about bouncing back. Instead, it is about growth and it is about development. So this model explores how communities grow, how communities develop and transform. So when they're confronting problems, communities engage in ongoing transformation. So if you like, this is not a bouncing back model. This is a bouncing forward model. I think that's quite interesting. And the final framework configures resilience as an ongoing transformative process. So building engaged communities through transitory and context specific solutions to particular problems. So this is, if you will, a series of dynamic strategies to manage complexity, and manage complex problems through building the connections between groups. So those of you that know the great work of John Uri, that great, famous, wonderful sociologist, and his work on complexity, you can see how Uri's work also feeds into Chandler. So what I am hope you're getting here is that that self-help definition about bounce back ability has now been transcended. We have two more models that I think are more useful. So for your doctoral program, the bouncing forward model I think is very useful and those communities managing challenge and change and transformation and creating a series of strategies to manage those changes on a community basis, both of those definitions I think are useful. Useful to think about your professional development as well and useful for thinking about your post-candidature care. So resilience is now a concept that's being used in my sort of field, so in regional development. We're seeing it deployed in international politics, managing difference, managing cultural difference in particular. It is necessary if we think about sustainable development or climate change that we think about those other two models of resilience. But it also has a really, and this is where I sort of get a bit interested and I'm doing some work at the moment, it also has this really odd and pretty problematic role in UK educational policy at the moment. There is this movement in the United Kingdom to, quote, teach resilience, end of quote. Now, the approach was an interesting one because it was using that first model, that first theory of resilience, and it was about teaching young people uh, how they could be resilient through social mobility. So when they fail to become socially mobile, so when they fail, they need strategies for resilience. So what is being taught is not a strategy for success through resilience, but how to manage failure. So one would assume if they can't gain social mobility, how they actually manage that in their daily life. So post Tony Blair and New Labour, isn't it fascinating that resilience has become a way to put a band-aid over the troubles and the problems in social mobility created post-Tony Blair. Really significant. So if you like, resilience is a band-aid to mask problems with social mobility in educational policy. Wow. So let's think about this now in context of your career and also your doctoral program. So you've said to me so often, so many of you, hundreds of you have said, I want to, as an individual, be more resilient. I want to be able to bounce back when I get knocked down, to manage failure, to manage disappointment. But 
when we're focusing on that issue, the greater or the bigger questions we need to ask about doctoral programs around the world are simply not being talked about. So supposedly, if you become more resilient, then you're going to be able to manage failure rather than ask the really complicated, difficult and necessary questions we need to be asking about doctoral education right now. So a couple of those really difficult questions. Why do half the people that start a PhD not finish it? Why do just under half of the people who commence with a supervisor not finish the program with that supervisor? So the individual student is being blamed here not the system, and this is an international issue. So resilience is a way to blame the individual student for simply not being strong enough, not having enough resilience, not able to withstand the pressures of a doctoral program. So this is like sort of a Winston Churchill thing, you know, a man who gains strength through adversity. So that's the Churchillian model. Now, resilience in both engineering and psychology is a relatively positive thing. So it is literally, in the case of engineering, overcoming pressure. But I'm really interested in moving this model on post David Chandler. Resilience has got to be about systems, about processes and about interactions rather than individuals and the capacity to manage change. So how can doctoral programs become more resilient, to allow a greater diversity of students to succeed in our work. Now, you'll get no apologies from me. A PhD program must be hard. It is the highest qualification we offer in a university. So intellectually, this has to be tough, full stop. But it doesn't have to be emotionally tough. It doesn't have to be socially tough intellectually tough, not emotionally tough, they're different things. And this has really been the sad and the odd part of my current job, if I'm honest with you. The international research has shown, particularly since I started this job a couple of years ago actually, that internationally PhD students are simply not managing in this program. The mental health concerns have now increased rapidly and radically. Now. And I think about this a lot. We're never going to know if simply in the old days, five years ago, ten years ago, students simply didn't report the mental health concern so they confronted an issue and simply left the program and never reported it. And now students are reporting it. So we'll never understand if simply it was underreported in the past or actually it's manifesting more in our present. We'll never know that. But there is no doubt that the PhD is an elite qualification. It must be. But we do have to think about how we render the system now more resilient. Because, look, we just have to call a spade a shovel, okay? The PhD program was designed for young, single, white men. That's what this program was designed for. So how do we render that program more resilient? And what I mean by resilient there is the systems and the structures more open, and more welcoming and more dynamic to handle greater social diversity. So while all this focus is supposedly on individual resilience, do you see how convenient that is? It's letting the systems and the structures and the institutions off the hook. Now I like these newer conceptualizations of, res of resilience, I really do, because they're tough, they're edgy and they're complex and I love that. These newer models are managing complexity a lot better, and that's because of the radical interdisciplinarity that we're seeing to create this new model of resistance. So it's coming from, say, theoretical physics, it's coming from historical sociology, it's coming from cultural studies, it's coming from continental philosophy, it's also coming from economics. And when all those paradigms come together, we're creating something pretty interesting, pretty edgy, pretty difficult. These models are challenging modernist ontologies, working really against the object and subject divide, and are really comfortable with the unknowability beyond epistemological barriers and differences. So it's actually saying, you know what, a lot of these systems and structures are unknowable. We know what we know, we don't know what we don't know. We need a system that is comfortable with unknowability. Fantastic. So to give you an example of how this would operate, say, with drugs, 
and drug users, which is a very common way we're applying this model, all the focus is on the individual drug user. So when in doubt, let's prosecute them, let's blame them for their individual weaknesses and their individual choices. Let's do that nice and easy, nice and clean. Let's build some jails. Let's put some drug users in there. Great. That's one way to do it. Or we could also think more widely about drug use, about what it is and why it happens. And why, for example, some drugs are legal. So alcohol, tobacco, drugs that cause a lot of damage, they're legal, right? Okay. And it allows us to then think about what is the function of drug use in wider social systems. So why do we see, for example, meth or particular drugs in areas of poverty, underemployment, unemployment, where health injustices take place? Why does drug use cluster in those areas with profound social issues? And thinking through that. So these are all ways of managing open systems. There's no cause and there's no effect here. It's very easy to blame an individual for their lack of power or strength or willpower or resilience. It's much harder, but also probably much more functional to think about what the systems and the structures and the institutions are doing to manifest this behavior. Now, right now, we have a greater diversity of PhD students in our programs than at any point in the history of higher education. And that diversity is by age, by race, by religion, by disciplines. It's incredible in terms of the diversity. So how could we, with that diversity, ever have a Fordist one-size-fits-all PhD program? As I've always said, we must keep the standards high. You'll never get me wavering on quality assurance, you know that. But we can have really evocative scaffolds to get us to those standards. Put another way, we can maintain our standards without standardization. They're different. So what's happening at the moment, I think, and this is perhaps perhaps what's causing that the mental health reporting issues in doctoral populations, I think, is individual students are blaming themselves for a lack of, and let's list it, intelligence, a lack of talent, a lack of time management, and a lack of resilience. Now, I don't want you blaming yourself for supposed failures, okay? When you do something wrong in life and you do fail, then front up. If you make a mistake, if you fail, own it, claim it, acknowledge it, apologize it if you apologize if you need to, but then you know what? Learn from it and move on. So save all that worry when you do actually fail. But if you're moving through life with this constant dread, and I see so many of you doing this, you're moving through the program with this constant dread that you're not good enough, this weird imposter syndrome stuff, wow, wherever that came from, that's stunning to me, or you're just saying, look, I'm not resilient enough, you're letting the systems, you're letting the programs, guys, off the hook. Frederick Nietzsche, always a party guy, so not, once said, he who has a why can endure almost any how, end of quote. Fred, great, thanks for that, mate. The point is, though, you know, motivation matters. So it is important that you have a why, a strong why. You understand the motivation, why you're doing a PhD, and that motivation might change. That's cool. But why do you need to suffer? Why does the how have to be about endurance? It should be and must be about a community of people around you who want you to succeed. When I was doing the final preparation for this vlog this week, I read the Meta article in Psychology Today on resilience. And this article, des take a breath, this article described a resilient person as having, quote, a positive attitude, optimism, the ability to regulate emotions, the ability to see failure as a form of helpful feedback. Even after misfortune, resilient people are blessed. Yes, that's, this is a quote. Resilient people are blessed with such an outcome that they're able to change course and soldier on. End of quote. Unbelievable. So who are these people? And wow, are they blessed? 
what a word to choose that resilient people are blessed let's get real here let's get real here our systems and our structures in education are easier on some groups than others full stop if you are a single parent in full-time work doing a PhD you know what your journey is going to be a lot tougher than a young man or woman without kids on a scholarship full stop this is an equal if you've got plenty of dough got plenty of money doing a PhD is much easier than if you're boiling up rice you're boiling up carrots to eat guys I get this there were times in my life when after I paid all my bills I had $20 left for food for two weeks so I get the rice carrot deal I understand that tough different hard to do hard to take so the notion that all of us are managing the same problems fears and challenges and that some people are magically blessed with the capacity to handle adversity is a complete denial of context it's also a complete denial of social justice it's just not real you don't lack resilience you lack systems and structures around you that respect your difference so therefore we need to honor your pathway into the PhD and make sure that our systems our structures our program give you enough space and enough time to succeed within it rather than blame yourself for not being resilient enough so next week I'm going to summon the doctoral studies literature once more and I'm going to ask some very difficult questions of you it's going to be a tough vlog for me to deliver maybe a tough vlog for you to hear but I'm going to ask some very tough questions to create a context around you in the good times so you've worked out who you are what's important to you so you've got a context around you so when things go wrong you're actually much more able to bend and manipulate and understand what is happening to you rather than break so I want you to have a context that is resilient rather than just assuming it's your fault and blaming yourself for a lack of resilience so thank you so much for being with me as always on this beautiful winter day in Adelaide how delightful is this Sun and I wish you love light and peace tea out